Welcome to To Knock Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Two Guys Exploring Christianity, with my dear friend, Greg Slowride McBride. Uh, yes, how are you doing today, William? And uh, I do have a message, um, and I promised her that I would mention Tammy from Florida, from Florida. She is a... Uh, I'm I'm going to define her as a ravenous listener to the show. <laughs> okay. She she literally dev- I don't even know how many episodes we've done. Uh, I I, can, I don't know probably I, 70, 80. But I think that she listened to every show in the space of one week. Oh, so my that's gosh, why I wow. call her a ravenous wow. listener to the I show gotcha. <laughs> and also a person that obviously doesn't have a life you know what i mean so <laughs> well, she wouldn't have time to and do all that probably so she uh, she obviously has a life <laughs> right. um she has give now we we've had a couple of good contenders of nicknames for you on the show oh <laughs> but i think i think that hers tammy from florida I think that hers takes the cake, and you will be now forever known as Sir Clicks a Lot. Sir. <laughs> I like the Sir Clicks a Lot. So, so from the Master 80s. Clicker was a that good one. Funny. But Sir, Sir Clicks a Lot. Sir Clicks a Lot. <clears throat> that's that's pretty good. Yeah, so. and you have to understand. Like a lot of people won't know what why that's funny, but it's actually there was a uh, was was he a rapper or something back in the eighties? Sir, uh, Sir Mixed a Lot. I think. Yeah, 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 it was very popular back in the day. So, Sir Clicks a yeah, lot. Yeah, <laughs> and Slow yeah, Ride so, Me, Brad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Tammy That's is funny. very close to your age. Okay. Um, Which is why she came up with that, probably. Age. That's why she yeah. came up with that. Nice. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So, so, she's, so I thought that was really good. And then, on a very serious note, um, if viewers have noticed that we haven't had any shows for a while, and part of that is. Uh, with Chris's mm, um, yes. dealings with with a medical uh, issue, right, right, and that's going fairly well. I take it. It is. I think so it is. We, right. we think the last surgery. Well, the surgery did what it was supposed to do, uh, but and they took out. Uh, they had surgery in three spots. One on their back was the main thing. It was like a big uh, about the size of my handprint from here to here, about nine inches. Okay, larger than that. From here, I actually measured it using my little wristband here. It was like oh, for, okay. it was like from the bottom of my wristband to the tip of my middle finger, and the okay. width of it was about this wide. It kind of went up to a point, and they they took out, it flared out like a football, and back down to a point again, and then yeah. they drew that all together and stitched it up, and so okay. and then they took uh, lymph nodes, three lymph nodes from each armpit, and uh, they did find one tiny tumor in one of the lymph nodes, but she didn't seem to be too troubled by it. The doctor, she said uh, the immunotherapy um, that she's having us go through uh, will will fix whatever's left, any traces of what's left, supposedly. So okay. so not out of the woods, right. but we are. You know what I mean? So all the, the, right. the, yeah. the, well, really, her, the really dangerous part was actually was actually the old wet thing, God, Burkish Yeah. So. yeah. so that's, and, and I know that William won't bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up. There has been a GoFundMe page that was started for you. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. yes. And that's, yep. Yep. And yeah. Julie, uh, in Alaska started that for you. Yes. And that was, that, I think that that's a very valid yeah. reason for a GoFundMe page, uh, because you're, uh, paying for this out of pocket. And, right. um, so that's, uh, viewers can help. So one thing, that I'm guilty of oftentimes, I tend to be, even though I'm a cut up, I, I really am. I, I'm always, my brain always runs like uh, looking for, for laughter, looking for entertainment. And we don't really focus very much on relationships, you know, the, uh, and I've had a couple of viewers uh, that have asked if, if my wife would appear on the show, and if your wife would appear on the show, 
my wife said emphatically no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that if Chris wanted your wife, Chris, if she wanted to appear on the show, I think viewers would like to meet our wives. And if I can talk my wife into it sometime, uh, maybe we can coordinate them so, uh, coordinate on the, at them. the same time. Oh, that yeah. would be, yeah, that would be good. They could see yes. all four of us at the same time. That'd be kind of nice. Yeah, that would be good. So I, again, I'm, I'm a dude, you know what I mean? And I just, I tend to focus on the, the the more not that I'm a scholar, yeah. but I tend to focus on the more scholarly points of this cosmic really uh, debate that goes on between Judaism and basically every other religion. Um, and I tend to focus wholeheartedly on that, and I tend to not focus on the relationships that that undergird what William and I both do, mm -hmm. um, because without my wife, uh, like I, I couldn't have the time and the, uh, wherewithal to do this. And I know that your wife is very important to the show as well. So I mean, uh, sometimes I mean, we yeah. don't remember them so well, but, That's a really good and, point, and yeah. women in particular, women viewers of the show, and there's a lot of women that view the show. Um, they tend to want to, you know, learn more about us. I think that's true. Um, it, it's yeah. a it's a different approach that a woman has to life than what most men have to life. Not better or worse, just different. And so possibly we could uh, sometime do a little more personal uh, stuff. Sure. I mean, like... Sure spend a little time doing personal stuff. There so that's cool. So, all right. Well, today right. it, so I, I want to address Jesus teaching on divorce. All right. Because in Christianity, um, in, in the very, in the conservative Christian church, this, I would, I would loop the, the church of God, the, uh, the up until recently, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, all of the Pentecostal churches, the Apostolic churches, um, they would all be considered. That's that's the way I grew up. I think that's kind of the way you grew up in that type of a church, you know, right. very conservative um, and serious. Now, so the church that I grew up in, the, the Churches of God General Conference. Um, a very conservative church, a church that, that at least when I was there, strove to try to understand the Bible, try to teach the Bible. We always thought that we were teaching the Bible. Um, but they, one of the things that always came up was the divorce. And divorce in, in the conservative evangelical Protestant church is kind of like about the worst thing that you can do. Would you agree with that from your experience yeah. in the, yeah, I mean, the divorce was, that was, that was a big thing. Divorce and, for it was a non, it was a, it was a non issue because you never could do it. It was just like, no, we don't oh, talk about it. You just, no. you stick together no matter what. Correct. No we what, have yeah. a church very close to where I live that prides itself on keeping track of the percentage of its members that get divorced. Wow. Um, and that, that is like less than 1%. And, you know, right. so kudos to you. That, yeah. I mean, we, we would never say, and Judaism never teaches that divorce is good, okay? It's not something that you set out to do. But... In the church, we learn mostly what we think we know about divorce from Matthew, the fifth chapter. And I'll read the 31st and the 32nd verses of Matthew, chapter 5. And Jesus is speaking. And he says, It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, 
let him give her a writing of divorcement. Okay? That is what the Hebrew Bible says. So if Jesus would just stop right here, then he would be accurately quoting from the Torah concerning divorce in Judaism. But Jesus doesn't stop right there. Goes to verse 32, and I, I, I never caught this when I was in the church. Because remember, when the church gives you the paradigm that Jesus is the creator of the heavens and the earth, which that's what the church teaches. Then when you get a verse like this next verse that I'm going to read, you, you don't think about it because, well, that's just, that's what it is. Jesus, Jesus is God. Jesus is the creator of the heavens and the earth. So verse 32, Jesus now departs from the Torah teaching of concerning divorce. And he says, but I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife Saving for the cause of fornication, okay, if he if you find her in bed with another man, Jesus permits you to divorce her. You cause her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. So if you marry a woman who has been divorced, then you commit adultery also. Even if you're a virgin, you commit adultery too. Well, this is like, this is a big deal. Because according to Jesus, the woman who gets divorced, she is an adulteress. That's what he says. If you divorce your wife, you cause her to commit adultery. That's what it says. Now, I am positive that I will get emails from Christian apologists that watch the show, and they will tell me what Jesus really means. <laughs> of course. <That's> pretty <laughs> much what happens every time I verbatim read something out of the most popular Christian translation of the New Testament that there is, i.e. the authorized King James Version. And they'll say, they but will, he meant well, this. Well, if he meant it, then why didn't he say that? Exactly, exactly. Or if this is the wrong translation that I have, then how do you know you have the right one now? Because, and I'm sure that since William is not that much younger than me, well, yeah, you are, you're, what, six years, seven years younger than me. But we're, we're close enough in age that when we went to church as young men, Nobody questioned the authorized King James Bible. Right. That's that was the gold. It's still the gold standard uh, in the. Uh, and I, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but the serious churches, i.e. King Jimmy, again, only. King Jimmy only. Yeah. Kim King Jimmy only. There's still a ton of them. Now, if you go to like Jack Hibbs church, OK. Okay, you can bring anything. You can bring your own translation, yeah. for heaven's sakes, because it's not about learning what it's about the 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 euphoria, the feeling, the relationships with the fellow parishioners that you get. Uh, you can take the Message Bible, you can take the Living Bible, whatever Bible you want to bring, that's valid. And if you ever take disparate translations english translations done by christians and you read them wow you you get just completely different stuff you know i had a guy a lot of different manuscripts i had a guy so, in a bible study one time we were a big bible study in this big church we were going to and he mentioned something that i think a lot of people knew was wrong and so I happened to bring up, hey, you know, you know what the Hebrew actually says. He goes, I don't care what the Hebrew says. He goes, all I care about is what the King James says. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I was like, wow. Well, He's remember, like, don't even, oh, they don't know what the Hebrew yeah, is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, remember, we've got a group of Baptist preachers in Indianapolis, Indiana, that have told me to my face that the King James translation is the only inspired translation. Wow. Of the Bible, of the whole Bible. 
Uh, uh, it's the only one. No kidding. Oh, that's why. And they're very serious. They're they're serious minded people. They they've got a little uh, a little play that they do. You know what I mean? I forget the name of the uncle. Uh, he was a Jewish guy, and da da da. And this devout Jewish Orthodox rabbi had his his most important book was a new testament and, and i'm like okay that that dude is not a rabbi skobeck singer federo malak yeah. it, okay no this this is not a serious orthodox rabbi that would have after he passes it would reveal that his most important book was a christian new testament uh, that that's that's made up okay that either you made up that the New Testament was his most important book, or you made up that he was an Orthodox rabbi. Uh, which does happen a lot. That does happen yeah. a lot, because like this Rabbi Schneider, who's on TV, that ironically, I just got a text message from. Um, he's like, he's he's just a Christian guy with long hair and, and uh, uh, tzitzis and all that. You know, he just... He's just a Christian guy that dresses up like a rabbi and then talks, you know, with more rabbinic authority. Yeah. But so it's it's just um, an orthodox rabbi. You will know them because they spend a lot of time in yeshiva. They spend a lot of time in studying the Talmud. One of the things that um, Dr. Michael Brown said, and I, uh, there is a, oh, I should, I should say this because Rabbi Blumenthal, who I believe he's a friend of the channel. Yes. Israel Blumenthal. He I is, think, uh, he's actually, I think he's part of Chabad, uh, Chabad, uh, Canada. Okay. Not, not, okay. I'm oh, sorry. That's, not, that's not, not true. Not sorry. Canada. No. Jews for Judaism. Canada, I think. Uh, yes, he is. Yes, okay, and his his website again, best rabbis, best website I've heard. Yourphariseefriend.com. You should you should go on his website because I got to accompany him to a uh, not a debate, but a we we were at Dr. Michael Brown's office in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, I, Rabbi Blumenthal, I went with him down there. So if you go on myphariseefriend.com, you can see th three hours of interaction between Rabbi Blumenthal and Dr. Michael Brown. And yours truly is sitting there taking notes uh, uh -huh. for Rabbi Blumenthal. Nice. And it's, it's a... It's different than a debate. I think it's more productive than a debate, actually, because there was just things that came out, um, very good things that came out. And like I said, I told Rabbi, or I told him, yeah, I told Rabbi William, <laughs> <laughs> I told William before the show started that there are, there are not just Rabbi Skobek and Rabbi Singer and Rabbi Federo and Malat that are that are brilliant rabbis. There are lots of brilliant rabbis. Yeah. Um, Rabbi Shof, Eman, uh, Emmanuel Shok yeah. Emmanuel Shoker. Emmanuel Shoket. Shoket. Yeah. Yeah. He's he told he taught me something. He he's been dead for twelve years, but he taught me something just recently. This is the this is the brilliance of YouTube videos. So. So I want to I want to concentrate here. Boy, I, it's been a long time since I did a show. <laughs> so we're going to read what what the Torah actually says. Do, does Jesus? And remember, when I was in the church, I thought Jesus could change the Torah. We got taught that Jesus could change the Torah. Right. That Jesus could too, change yeah. anything he wants. Yeah. yeah, you got taught that yeah. too. So. And I never knew that the Torah itself teaches that you can't change it. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, this, but 
You don't ever learn this stuff when you go to church. I don't care how long you go to church. You won't learn this. You'll learn it from rabbis. So in 24 of Deuteronomy, verse 1, if a man marries a woman and lives with her, and it will be that she will not find favor in his eyes, for he found in her a matter of immorality, and he wrote her a bill of divorce and presented it into her hand and sent her from his house, and she left her house, his house, and went and married another man. And the latter man hated her and wrote her a bill of divorce and presented it to her hand and sent her from his house. Or the latter man who married her for him to himself will die. Her first husband who divorced her shall not again take her to become his wife after that she had been defiled, for it is an abomination before Hashem. You shall not bring sin upon the land of Hashem. Your God gives you as an inheritance. Okay. okay. Let me read. Let me read Leviticus first before I say anything. Go to Leviticus. Leviticus for Mr. Katz. <laughs> uh, chapter 21, verse 14. This is only concerning the Kohen, or the priestly tribes. Uh, back up to 13. He shall marry a woman in her virginity. Okay, a Kohen. A Kohen. This is, remember, this is exclusively for the Kohen. A widow, a divorcee, a desecrated woman, a harlot, he shall not marry these. Only a virgin of his people shall he take as a wife. Thus shall he not desecrate his offspring from his people, for I am a Shem who sanctifies them. Go to the next chapter, 22, verse 13. Uh, we'll start at 12. If a Cohen's daughter shall be married to a layman, she may not eat the separated holies. She can't eat at the at the at the table in the temple. And a Cohen's daughter who will become a widow or a divorcee and not have offspring, she may return to her father's home. As in her youth, she may eat from her father's food, but no layman may eat of it. Okay, so where is the part? Tell you what, let me let me read from Numbers chapter 30 real quickly first. Numbers chapter 30, go to verse uh, 10. Numbers 30. Verse 10. The vow of a widow or a divorcee, anything she had prohibited upon herself, shall remain upon her. This is the section of scripture where we learn that if a young woman is under her father's house and he hears her make a vow. Okay, let's just, okay, let's put ourselves into this room. Uh, a daughter probably 13, 14 years old, she, her father hears her say, I vow that I will not eat peanuts. Okay? And the vow she makes is before Hashem. And her father hears it, and her father thinks, you know, the only thing we've got to eat for the next two months is peanuts. He, will, he can release her from that vow. If he doesn't say anything, then the vow sticks. She's got to honor the vow she made. The same thing is true of a woman who is married to her husband. If she makes a vow, I will not eat peanuts, and the husband hears it, and he can release her from the vow. If he doesn't, then she has to abide by the vow that she made to Hashem. That's what's in context here. That's what's in the case. So, this woman who is a divorcee, she's been divorced, she doesn't have anybody to release her from her vow of not eating peanuts that she made before Hashem. 
So what I want you to focus on here is where in these writings is the woman who got divorced an adulteress. Right. And that would be a big thing. Why? Okay, so you said two things that was, that was very important to me. Um, one, uh, what, what I was just mentioning was why is that so important is, is kind of like the reason why it's important to know the difference between a young woman and a virgin, right? Um, if, if a woman is adulterous, then there's penalties for that, uh, even, death penal- right. even death penalties, with whatever you want to call it, right? So yeah. if that's the truth, and all of these talkings about this, about divorces, it's never mentioned anywhere in those, right? Never. Now, a woman would be an adulteress if she had sex. She was married and she had sex with a married man. And there was people, yeah, there was witnesses. Yeah, and, yeah. and people that witnessed it, yes. Yeah. If, if no people witness it, yeah. then there is really no temporal punishment for that. Right. And it could be forgiven like any other sin. I mean, when when the two parties would agree no longer to do it, either party can ask forgiveness from Hashem, and for Hashem forgives you if you quit doing it. So, so my point here is, and and Christian that's watching this show, please, please, any time that. Jesus now Jesus admits here that he's changing it because he states what Moses said and then he adds but I say unto you in other words but me now did Jesus really speak these words I don't know if he did or not because this is not written by Jesus this is not written in the name of Jesus the author of the book of Matthew is unknown to us. Um, the time of the writing of the book of Matthew is well, well, decades after the alleged events unfolded. So I could never, like, accuse Jesus of changing the word of Hashem. In, in, in the title... I said, why, or I think, why didn't Jesus understand divorce or, or whatever? But we have to be careful. In other words, it's not my job to say that Jesus um, is going to suffer because he changed the word of Hashem. I don't know. I do know what every church teaches, and every church teaches that this is the word of Jesus. So preachers, apologists, Christians watching this, you have to make your decision. Did Jesus change the word of Hashem or are these words attributed to him by anonymous authors to prove a point of I I don't know what or who knows what or to be able to possibly more control women or I don't know. I'm conjecturing now, but... So one thing that it, it's I can, important for us to know. Go ahead. Yeah. One thing that I could say if I was going to try to defend this writing, if, if it was Jesus's, would be that it here that now depending on what translation you're reading from, but this one uh, it it says it hath been said. He didn't say it was written. Uh, he didn't say who it was said by. For all he knows, they could have been at the coffee shop and heard somebody you know, yelling at somebody else right, at Starbucks yeah. <laughs> saying, well, no, this is how it is. But, but it, 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 right. again, I have seen other places where it says for it is written, uh, which, which does really correlate straight to Torah. But this, right. to me, I think it does too. But I'm just saying if I was trying yeah. to justify Jesus in this, this would be kind of the angle of an approach. Right, yeah. It, I mean, Moses did say that you write a bill of divorcement when you're divorcing your wife. What Moses didn't say anything about was, well, now that woman's an adulterer. Right, right, right. Anybody that marries her is an adulterer. Yeah. And uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, oh, and that's the point. Yeah. That, that, thank you. That's what that, that was the other thought I had earlier. So uh, you brought that up, and it was perfect because even if there's 31, uh, even if it was just simply talking about somebody else, Maybe Moses, right. maybe Moses's neighbor, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> 32 stands free stands on its own. 
He's given you yeah. his interpretation of the law, and it's wrong. It doesn't yeah. say that. So he's adding Correct. the Torah. Yeah. So you can't add right. or take away. And here's the, here's the danger in this, because when I was a 30-something young man in the church, I used this exact verse in counseling for a friend of mine who was thinking about getting married to a woman who had been divorced. And I thought that I was helping because I was trying to tell him not to do this, even though he was obviously madly in love with her. And he did marry her and they quit going to church. And I mean, I, that's this is like really life changing stuff for people that's done out of ignorance on my part. But well, no, not out of ignorance, out of by what the church had taught me, you know. And right. again, I never read what Moses actually said yeah. about divorce. You were clearly instructed and on how to handle that. So we are very clearly instructed on how to handle that. Um, King David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, he committed adultery because he was married and Bathsheba was married. That's the reason he committed adultery. If Bathsheba's husband would have died of natural causes or would have legitimately died in battle, David, even though he already had 18 wives, could have married Bathsheba and would have not sinned before Hashem. The fact that her husband was alive, his wives were alive, he didn't marry her, they just had sex, and that was that was his sin. And what I just described for you is totally lost in the church, because in the church, you will never learn that David had 18 wives. No. Never. Because David would be sinning. I taught a Sunday school class that Solomon was sinning, and I was I was kind of right on this one. Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines, and the king of Israel was never to multiply wives or horse or horses right, right. for himself. Because so 18 wives was okay, and okay, where's where is the needle at? Well, 18 was okay, but 300 was not. <laughs> and again, what I'm talking to you about now is just it's heresy in the church, heresy, because. A man shall cleave unto his wife, and the twain shall be one. And you have one wife, and that's it. Well, I'm sorry. That is not what Judaism teaches. That is not. And a, a very prominent rabbi uh, taught me that even into the 1900s, it was still completely legally permissible for a Jewish man to have more than one wife. Okay, there, there was no prohibition against it. The prohibition against like the Mormons in our country having more than one wife is from the Christian perspective that you only have one wife and that's it. The, the Hebrew Bible does not teach that. So, so there's one more reference. It, it's shocking how little that the Hebrew Bible speaks about divorce. Because you can get out your Strong's Concordance and you can go to divorce and divorcement and you find just a just a handful of scriptures. The one uh, the one of the other places is Isaiah chapter fifty, where divorce is talking about. But this is in the context of Hashem versus Israel, and it says, "Thus says Hashem," verse fifty of chapter or verse one of chapter fifty. Thus said Hashem. What is your mother's bill of divorcement by which I sent her away? What is it? Where is it? What? 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 Where's the Where's the bill of divorcement that I, speaking in the place of Hashem here, Hashem, Hashem is speaking. Where's that at? What is it? You got a copy of it because Hashem abides by his Torah. <laughs> so if he's going to divorce Israel, he's going to give her a written decree, a written divorcement, because that's what a husband does when he divorces his wife. Or to which of my creditors have I sold you? 
I, 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 which one? Behold, it is for your iniquities you have been sold, your rebellious sins that your mother has been sent away. I, I, Hashem, I haven't given you a bill of divorcement. I haven't sold you to creditors. You're still my wife. And I got a question on this one time, a long time ago. Uh, well, Israel can't come back as the bride of Hashem because he divorced her. No, he didn't give her a written divorcement. Hashem didn't divorce. Hashem still longs for his bride, Israel, to return to him. And his bride, Israel, will return to him. We are explicitly told this. Um, uh, you can go to chapter 31 of Jeremiah, go to the last 10 verses of that chapter, and you will read how long Israel will be the chosen people, the bride of Hashem. That's how long will he be the apple of their eye? How long will Israel be the apple of Hashem's eye? Forever. That's all right. Hashem doesn't have his eye on any other women so to speak. <laughs> In the Christian Bible, yeah. apparently Hashem had his eye on Mary. Yeah, no uh, kidding, right? <laughs> <laughs> awkward. So, awkward, awkward, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, all right. Well, that's that's all I got to say about that. Um, okay. There is, I, I do want to, oh my goodness, we've got like 10 minutes left. <laughs> Actually, no, we've got, uh, technically we have about a half an hour. Uh, cause oh, we, we do. We, yeah, we've been streaming oh, we for got, okay. All right, okay. well, 50 minutes, then. but we had uh, 16 minutes of, of pre, pre-shop pre talk. Okay, all right, uh, okay. Well, then. And, and just, just as a heads up for the viewer out there, um, this is the uh, uh, the pre, what do you call it, pre-game and post-game uh, in, <laughs> oh, <laughs> interviews the, and stuff like that. Uh, on, on like on like NFL Live. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so you'll, uh, so the benefit uh, or a benefit of having – um, being a member is that once this stream ends, you can go back and watch everything from the beginning, the 16 minutes of, of chit chat that we were, you know, talking about really important oh. stuff, like oh, it, funny, it funny, joking important. stuff. It was <laughs> very, 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 very important. Stuff. But that will not be in this clip of the video if you're watching this on the replay. So if you want to see the original okay. with all the pre and post uh, show content, you'll have to join the channel five bucks a month. And that'll also gain access for you for the uh, chat room as well. So. Okay. Yes. Um, so, do we open so the we, phone lines up, or what? What do you want to do? You can open the phone lines, and I will start on what I like it. Uh, Rabbi, Shof, pronounce his name again. Shochet. Shochet. Emmanuel Shochet. Shochet. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not getting too. The one I'm thinking of is off of uh, uh, of Chabad.org. I think it is. Okay. Yeah. He's. He died, I believe, in 2011 or 2013. Um, he, deba he debated yeah, that's uh, right. <clears throat> Michael Brown, Dr. Michael Brown. Um, and so that's that's one of the things. So I, I want to, and so Rabbi Emmanuel Shoket is the one that taught me this. So I have used, uh, if you want to get your fingers ready, we're going to be in... Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 23. All right, let me get there. All right. Fast. If you have found this channel helpful and this has blessed you or your family members in helping bring you out of idolatry, I would love to have your support. Please consider donating to this channel directly. That would be pretty awesome. Donations can be done through PayPal, Patreon, or through snail mail. The links to all are added in the video description below. You can also click this link and it will take you straight to my website with a donate button, which leads you right through PayPal. Thank you once again for your kindness and consideration for supporting this work. Blessings for you, your family, and your home. Shalom. Uh, if you want to get your fingers ready, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 23. All right, let me get there. All right. Fast. Matthew. Matthew chapter 16 and Matthew chapter 23. So where is Matthew again? Uh, Matthew 16. <laughs> no, I was, I was joking. I said, where's Matthew? What? What's that? I said, where's Matthew found? Oh, where's Matthew? <laughs> Somewhere between Genesis and Deuteronomy. It's right I'm before sure. Mark. 
<laughs> <laughs> okay, Matthew 16 and Matthew 23. Matthew 16, and we're going to start at verse 5 in Matthew. Well, you know what? I, I, I was reading, like, pre-show reading. I'm going to just, this is a sidebar, but it's at the very beginning of chapter 16. And again, this is one of the things that when you're in the church, this makes total sense to you. And then when you read it and you have a cursory understanding of the Hebrew Bible, you what what's going on here? The Pharisees, so 16.1, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees. Remember, Pharisees believed in resurrection sadducees did not believe in resurrection of the dead the pharisees are what has survived there are no sadducees left but fair like um well rabbi blumenthal rabbi singer they they are pharisees i think rabbi skobeck is a pharisee um but they're they are descendants from Moses, they're called Pharisees. In the church, the Pharisees are just roundly criticized all the time. They are virtually anti-Christ in the church. So, but the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Okay, red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in morning, sailors take warning. That's that's a, a cute way of remembering huh, this verse. And sailors still, ancient sailors used that. Wow. Oh, ye hypocrites. Ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. All right? Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're wicked, vile men. They came to tempt Jesus. They asked him for a sign of who he was. <clears throat> I would, I have done that same thing with a person who claimed to be the Messiah. Okay. Am I a wicked and adulterous generation? Am I a wicked person? Am I, am, was I simply, and I'm speaking, of course, of Sammy the Messiah yeah, from great. Texas. Yeah. I asked him, what are the signs that you are the Messiah? What, what are those signs? When, when the Pharisees who, the Pharisees would have absolutely known every sign that will come along with the Messiah. It's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. It's only hidden from people that go to evangelical uh, Christian churches. Well, and other, other religions hide it as well. But the, the Hebrew Bible is very open about what signs there will be when the Messiah comes. Uh, roughly eight very clear signs. So to ask someone who is claiming that he is the Messiah, this is just bait and switch on Jesus' part. <laughs> I, I, I would never have ever guessed that I would say that, but you know how when you ask somebody, and Sammy the Messiah did the same thing to me. <laughs> When I asked him, think about this. Jesus could have answered him, the, them, because the Sadducees knew all the signs that would accompany the return of the Messiah. They didn't, they didn't not believe those. They just don't, they just didn't think that when Ezekiel talks about the valley of the dry bones, they didn't think that was literal. 
Okay. And okay, you're not going to go to eternal hell because you don't understand everything in the Tanakh. There are legitimate interpretations of various things in the Tanakh, but the signs of the Messiah returning are very ironclad. Jesus could have answered, well, we don't have any wars going on, do we? That would have been a legitimate answer on Jesus' part. Jesus could have said, well, all of the children of Israel have returned to the land of Israel. He, he could have said that because those are two real clear signs. Jesus could have said, well, everyone knows who my father is. Uh, again, that any of those signs Jesus could have given as as clear teaching that he is the Messiah. But Hashem made it to where it's so easy to falsify the claims of anyone who claims to be the Messiah. <laughs> All you have to do is just ask him those questions. Like I asked Sammy. And Sam, amazingly, Sammy's not the Messiah. Uh, uh, shocker. Shocker, I know that all the viewers of this show are shocked, but I'm not some genius who figured this out. I just read it. And S Sammy's not the Messiah because they're still fighting in Israel. We need to really pray for Israel because I think that is the war is going to do nothing but get hotter. They're, we're fighting in Lebanon. We're fighting in Syria. We're fighting in Iraq. We're fighting everywhere. So since we're still fighting on the earth today, Sammy is not the Messiah. Okay, anybody can claim to be the Messiah. William, with his dapper hat, can claim to be the Messiah because he's wearing a very dapper hat. And, and I will ask William as well. William, great to see you. Glad you're finally here. We've been waiting a long time for you. Hey, How's it going on all the Jewish people being back in the land? William would say, oh, oh, well, uh, uh. <laughs> still got a lot of them living in Borough Park and Lakewood, New Jersey. <laughs> uh, so, well, William, then you're not the Messiah either. Oh, uh, yeah, I thought the dapper hat got me in. <laughs> but what if I just started, no, yeah. but I could fix that just simply by ridiculing you and saying that you don't know what you're talking about. And then all the exactly. problem solved. I'm now problem the Messiah solved. again. And that's exactly what Jesus did here. Mm -hmm. He solved the problem by calling them names, basically saying they don't know what they're talking about. And was the was the generation that received the sign of the... Uh, in, in other words, if if Hashem gives a sign, like in famously in Isaiah 7, I'm going to take that one. The sign given by Hashem to Ahaz, the king, that the, the child that would be born will eat cream and honey before he's old enough to even know right from wrong, does that mean that all, the only people that receive that sign are wicked and adulterous? If the, if the only people that get signs are wicked and adulterous, then why would Hashem bother to give signs? Because Hashem does give us signs. The, the sign that the Messiah is here will be that there's no more war. So is that generation, since I've asked people who claim to be the Messiah, does that make me wicked and adulterous? Apparently so, because that's what Jesus said to the Pharisees that asked him first. And understand that when we're in the church, we assume that what they're asking for is like a sign like, uh levitate yourself or uh uh 
make us make us a six course meal like you made for the with the loaves and the fishes what whatever no the pharisees when they ask him for a sign they're not asking him they want to know like the signs i just said that's what they're asking him for they want to know those signs and so rabbi shoket okay taught me what i'm going to do next and that's at verse five and when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which then Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith. Why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not understand, neither remember the five loaves and the five thousand, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves or the four thousand, and how many baskets you took up? How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to your concerning bread, not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So this whole thing that Jesus is teaching them, don't you trust those Pharisees and Sadducees. Beware of the leaven that they teach. Beware of their doctrines. They are wrong. They asked me for a sign. Okay, pretty clearly established here, don't you think? So, and I could just ask a rhetorical question here. I would say, hey, what do you think Jesus thought of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? What do you think he thought of the Pharisees? Because he lumps them in. What did he think of them? Good guys? Hmm. I don't think you could possibly say that Jesus' interaction here with the Pharisees and the Sadducees is him thinking that they are good guys. He tells you, he tells his disciples to beware of them all right i again i didn't write this and i taught this but i never made the connections how did you not understand that i spake it not to you concerning bread but that ye should beware of the leaven of the pharisees and of the sadducees then understood they that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay. Very, very clear. I'm, I'm anxious for the first Christian apologist that tells me what Jesus really meant here. Okay. <laughs> and please tell me. Then in the same book of Matthew, we go to the 23rd chapter. We start at verse 1, chapter 23. Then spoke Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. Okay? Jesus only got one set of disciples. Remember what he just taught them. Now he's speaking to them again, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Jesus here agrees that the Sadducees' doctrine of the resurrection of the dead being nothing is not in Moses' seat, because only the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. But remember, he lumped the Pharisees together with the Sadducees in chapter 5. Now we're in chapter 23. The scribes at Jesus speaking... Red letters in your King James Bible. 
the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All. How, oh, hey, William, how? What, what am I supposed to trust the scribes and the Pharisees in? What, what? With everything concerning all. the law, yeah. All. Oh, all. Yep. All, therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe that you observe and do but do not do after their works for they say and do not do they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and they lay on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Okay, so I have spent quite a bit of time trying to wrap my head around this. Because this is about as oxymoron of a teaching as I can figure. <laughs> this makes zero sense zero jesus establishes well i think the most important thing that jesus establishes here is and again i take this as one of the evidences that jesus is not ever claiming that he is actually the creator of the heavens and the earth and this this very much shores that up because Jesus says, Jesus doesn't say the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. I'm doing away with Moses' seat. You are the guys that's going to sit on Jesus' seat. No, he, he doesn't say that. He's addressing the multitude and his disciples here. The disciples that he just told that you have to beware of those Pharisees. you got to beware of them. Their leaven is terrible. Now we go 18 chapters later, and the same Jesus, so we are instructed, tells them, whatever the Pharisees tell you to observe... You observe that and do it. Okay? Very clear. Jesus is establishing the primacy of the Torah, of the seat of Moses. There can be no other interpretation here. Bring it, a Christian apologist, because if you're going to worm out of this... Uh, you can, if, if you, if you worm out of this, then there's no reason for me to read any of your Christian New Testament, because this is a very clear teaching. The, fri the scribes sit on Moses' seat, the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, whatever they tell you to do, do it. Oh, but don't. Do not ye after their works, after their, don't do what they do. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move with, move them with one of their fingers. Okay, so. I want us to try to get our heads around this. Let's put William in the role of a Pharisee. All right. William, you're my Pharisee. I'm your multitude. I'm one of your multitude. Jesus just told me to do whatever you tell me to do. All right. Okay. Okay. Right? But I'm not supposed to do as you do because you 
placed on me a heavy burden that I can barely bear. And you won't lift a finger to help me. So do I have to do that or don't I? <laughs> so my, my... What would be the teaching that I could reasonably come to here? My thing that I understood was that Jesus was dealing at the time. He was dealing with corrupt Pharisees at the time. They were, they were teaching the right things, but they just they were they weren't actually doing the right things. So he said, "Do what they say, but don't do what they do." That that was the well, in a nutshell. That was the claim. But one of the things that they tell men to observe and do is to carry these heavy burdens, which Jesus just told us if they tell you to do something, you have to do it. You have to observe and do it. Then Jesus tells us the Pharisees lay heavy demands on the people. So you don't do that. So as a multitude, as a member of the multitude here, what, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> if, if my Pharisee William tells me, um, I don't know what, hey, you've got to bring me a bushel of sweet peas for an offering next week. And remember, in the, who has the final authority according to the Torah? The rabbis the pharisees yep. the teachers that we are explicitly told that in the book of deuteronomy that hey moses when i'm gone you gotta let even if they're not the and the, it doesn't actually say this but the the teaching is there even if they're not of the same caliber and level as like moses which nobody's gonna be but even if they're like not the greatest, not the greatest rabbis, not the greatest Pharisees, you still have to listen to them and don't you dare turn from the left or to the right from what they tell you to do. Because, you know, they're my, they're my people on teaching the Torah. I'll deal with them. You have to do what they tell you to do. So here Jesus creates, as far as I can tell, and please help me out here, Christian apologists, watching the show. Because just a clear reading of this is one of the biggest dichotomies I've ever run into, uh, just in my readings. That is what he says. Verse 5, But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and large their borders of their garment. Love the uppermost rooms at the feasts and the chief seats at the synagogues. The greetings at the marketplace. What the, does that have to do with? <laughs> the Pharisees are honored in all of those places. In Israel today. Pharisees, i.e. rabbis of the, I, I mean, they, you get those honors today. It's a respect. I, I have been to synagogues where they ask if there's a Levite or a Kohen in the, in the gathering. That's one of the things they ask. They ask that because they will honor them if they're there. That's, it's that's it's like being that's, it's like saying don't don't call anybody doctor or scientist. You only have one doctor and one scientist, that's a creator. So when you go to a hospital, uh, do you ask for a janitor? Do you ask for just a, a random name? <laughs> don't they need to know yeah. what what position yeah. they hold? You would think you know? exactly. We so. we define people by what they do. That's very well. Like you, you're Sir Clicks a lot. You know what I mean? So you're yeah. gonna you're you're gonna click a lot, you know. That's, that's funny. <laughs> but we define we define people by what they do all the time. That's hilarious. Goodness gracious, you just you just naturally do. But so as I 
as I read my New Testament more, I get this idea. I more and more get this idea that Jesus didn't write this stuff. This is written by Greeks who are jealous of the status, so to speak, that even though Israel at this time is occupied by the Romans, the Romans have pretty much let them self-govern as long as they as long as they pay taxes. Rome doesn't care what you worship. Yeah. And I think that these writers of these books that we call the Gospels are jealous of the just the the automaticness yeah. of the respect that Pharisees get. So by our them. color, our current color, uh, will probably add to uh, your suspicion oh. as well. Yes, let's, so let's, let's go take and, a color before we completely there run we go. out of time. We actually just hit an hour now of actual. Of, Are of you actual, serious? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, so yeah. All right. All right. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Tammy from Florida, you're, you're live. Go ahead and, and present your statement. Hello. Hello, Mr. McBride. How are you? I'm very well, Tammy from Florida. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. I'm not sure if this has been said, but I find it ironic that, you know, Jesus made the statement regarding Pharisees, but then Paul says he is the Pharisee of Pharisees, so be extra careful of him. <laughs> oh, but that's not my goodness. <laughs> See, this is why we have callers because the callers are smarter than the host and me <laughs> that's just the case so oh, well wait so that, there's that, more <laughs> there's, okay before you go further tammy from florida somehow tammy from florida got my phone number and she called me oh. and this is this is the the ravenous uh <laughs> this, so i this owe my ravenous. so i owe my sir clicks a lot to tammy you owe oh, sir clicks a lot to, to this lady and she's a ravenous uh, that's great of the show <laughs> thank you tammy that, that's awesome that is brilliant that's brilliant because you are correct that well, Paul doesn't actually make that claim. That claim is made for Correct. him that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I believe that's in the book of Acts, if I'm not incorrect. But go ahead, please, Tammy. <laughs> uh, the second point was, you know, let's let's take the route that Jesus was an insurrectionist. Correct. Correct. So you could. There are times where I have intentionally inserted the word Roman, where it read Pharisee. So because everything else is so contrived, what are the chances the statements that he was making were in fact regarding the Romans? But let's insert the word Pharisees because that's how we need to write the story. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. That's very interesting. Yeah. So give me a, would you have in the front of your mind, and this, it's tough to be put on the spot, would you have a verse uh, in I, mind that you might think that might be the case? Sure. I, well, I mean, you've actually stated one a few moments ago, which was uh, you put burdens around their necks. Um, Correct. Laws that are, just, you know, we're talking, and I'm sorry, I'm doing that off the top, I top of my head. I see where I um, see where you're going with this. I do. Yes. Yes. So yes. what if, because the belief is, of course, and I'm sorry, guys, I'm still learning the whole JC versus don't say Jesus versus uh, I. Oh, you know, right. we don't. Yeah, so please, please forgive my ignorance. It's, I'm getting there. We're pretty laid back around here. <laughs> so basically, in, in, the, in a teaching scenario, there, there are liberalities that can be taken in a teaching setting. And this is a, this is a teaching and learning session. So, it, you know what I mean? Correct. So it's not as not well, a Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. So, yes, I, I can see again if insurrection was his crime and death was his punishment, he would have been outspoken towards the Romans, not towards the Pharisees. Yeah, that's, that's very possible, yes. So most, most all of the people that Rome executed by crucifixion were political prisoners, so to speak, or pris po political adversaries. Tammy, go ahead and hang Rome. up and tune in for the rest of your oh. answer, okay? Thank you. Oh. Sure thing. Thank okay, you so you bet. much. You bet. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. So the the idea that that Rome would execute you 
because you were just teaching people about the Bible, okay, you can never say that that could never happen, but the odds of it happening are very slight and very small. It's as small as the odds that you weren't thrown into a mass grave when you were crucified. So it, there are a couple of times when the Roman authority, in this case Pontius Pilate, would have allowed a very important person to be taken down and his body given to um, his family, most almost exclusively to his family. But we do have a few historical uh, records of a body that got crucified by the Roman authorities being taken down and given to go in. But very slight odds, just like the odds that you were teaching about heaven and you get crucified for that. Very, very slight. Probably, or historically probably, Jesus got crucified if he was crucified, and I'm I'm conceding that he got crucified, okay? Because that seems a logical uh, end. If Jesus is speaking of a king and a kingdom that will replace the Caesar, and if he is fomenting that among the people, then he could very likely get crucified. Um, but again, the odds are that Jesus was a political adversary or perceived as a political adversary to the Roman authority, and therefore he got crucified. The odds that Jesus' body was not dumped into a mass grave with all of the other bodies is very, 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 very slight because the political prisoners were not afforded the mercy of having their body given to a family member. Again, virtually nobody was afforded that mercy, but on occasion it did happen. So it's not, so, so the, the New Testament story that they took down the body of Jesus and, you know, well, depending on which gospel you read, uh, you know, what happened to it, uh, is very good, but so. Well, thank thank you right. very much, Jenny from Florida. Um, Tammy, she she was very Tammy. What? Tammy. Ta oh, no, Tammy! Oh gosh! Oh, <laughs> Tam yeah, I have, it's okay. I have that woman's number in my phone. I called her the wrong name. <laughs> That's so, all right. I'm Tammy sure. Tammy from Florida. Thank you so much, and thank you for your enthusiastic consumption. Yes, of indeed. And the knock talk. <laughs> right on. Oh. Very cool. Okay, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, Y'all sit tight. We're going to hang on for a few minutes after we end the show uh, just to kind of button up anything that needs to be done. And so you all have a wonderful week. Be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, turn on notifications. And if you haven't done it yet, you feel like you want to join the channel, just look for the join link on the same page and follow those hoops. You all have a great day. And... Shalom to you guys. And I'm not sure when the next show is. Just follow me on Facebook and YouTube and you'll find <laughs> out. Thanks. Peace. Shalom, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com. T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shaifa